Frequently, I hear of believers who feel like their lives are unraveling. Broken marriages, rebellious children, emotional stress, physical illness, financial catastrophe, church friction, loneliness. These represent only some of the problems confronting many of God's children. It's important to counsel fellow believers who are going through the flames of adversity with the Apostle Peter's admonition, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The Lord can give wondrous peace in the midst of adversity, but that reality doesn't remove the problem. A woman who has recently lost her husband is not unspiritual because she has a sense of loneliness. A couple who has suffered the loss of a child are not acting inappropriately because they are grieving. Parents who are heartsick because their unwed daughter is pregnant are not to be chastened as though they have a lack of trust in God. A Christian businessman who has serious financial losses is not evidencing a lack of faith because he has legitimate concerns over pressing obligations. The peace of God that passeth understanding and the heartache of the world are not mutually exclusive. The Lord Jesus Christ reminded his followers that in the world you will have tribulation, which is pressure, affliction, and difficulty. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The trials of life are real, and so are the heartaches. Christians aren't exempt from life's problems simply because they're Christians. But God has provided a crucial truth for His children, which when rightly understood, can make present trials, even death itself, little more than passing inconveniences in the scope of eternity. God never promised His children that they'd go through life buying stock when it's low and selling it when it's high, that life would be a quiet, carefree stroll down Easy Street. In his epistle to Titus, Paul admonished his son in the faith to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter had the same hope in view when he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter's living hope is the same as Paul's blessed hope. In the Bible, blessing conveys the idea of the divine impartation of life and the goodness of God upon that life. The blessed hope is far more than just a theological concept which is devoid of relevance, practicality, or power. On the contrary, it has deep and profound significance for us today. A look at biblical history can shed more light upon this crucial concept. Immediately following the creation of Adam and Eve, the Bible says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. At the very outset of human history, it became clear that it was not the divine intent that Adam and Eve be a solitary pair created to roam the earth. In blessing them, God imparted the potential for life and goodness, not only on Adam and Eve, but on their offspring as well. Immediately after the universal flood, which destroyed all humanity except Noah and his family, the scriptures state, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. Because of the wickedness of men, God destroyed the world that then existed. But it was not his intent to reduce mankind to eight souls, Noah, his wife, three sons, and three daughters-in-law. Noah's family was not to be the last of humankind. Again, God's blessing would provide the potential for life and the goodness of God on mankind on this side of the flood. When God called the patriarch Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, he gave to him a series of promises in Genesis 12. Most important among them was the promise that, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Because God blessed Abraham, he would be fruitful and become the father of nations, the Jewish and the Arab peoples. However, it is in the Lord Jesus Christ that the promise of blessing through Abraham's seed finds ultimate fulfillment. From Abraham through Christ, 
life and goodness would flow to people of every kindred, tongue, and tribe. Believers who, like Father Abraham, would exhibit faith in God's provision of a sacrifice for sin. When the children of Israel were about to enter the promised land, God informed them that if they obeyed his voice, there would be blessing. If they disobeyed, there would be cursing. And then God himself defined what was meant by blessing and cursing. He said, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, which is blessing, and death and evil, which is cursing. When the Apostle Paul speaks of the blessed hope, he is talking of a hope that is alive and good, that has the breath of God upon it. And in his use of the word hope, there is nothing of speculation. When we use the word hope today, it carries with it some degree of uncertainty. But the hope which Paul and Peter had in mind is certain and sure. It is only a hope in the sense that its realization is still in the future. But what is this blessed hope, which is alive, good, certain, and eternal? The answer, Jesus is coming again. Not to a stable and a manger, but to a palace and a throne. Not as a lamb, but as a lion. Not in silence, but in roaring. Not with humility, but with glory, not to die, but to judge. Yes, the blessed hope for the Christian is the return of the Son of God. But there is much more that awaits us in connection to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's what we'll discuss in part two of this video series.